The last talk of the morning session will be given by Professor uh, Wang Chaoxuan. Um, he would, uh, sorry, she would speak about uh, the topic on um, toward the fundamental limit of efficient quantum transductions. Before that, let me give a brief introduction of uh, Professor uh, Wang Chaoxuan. So she received her bachelor and master degree in physics from National Taiwan University. She completed her PhD in physics at the University of Maryland College Park in August 2018. While in UMD, she worked with Jack Taylor on quantum optics, matter light interactions, quantum simulations, and condensed matter theory. From 2018 to 2022, she joined Professor Liang Jiang's group at Yale University and the University of Chicago to work on quantum transductions, quantum information processing, and quantum error correction. In 2022, Wang Xiaoxuan joined the Department of Physics at the National Taiwan University as an as assistant professor. Her current research interests focus on quantum information science, fault-tolerant quantum computation, and quantum communications. So that's welcome, Professor Wang. Thank you. I'd like to first thank the organizers for the invitation and thank you, Ming Xiu, for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, my name is Chao Xuan Wan. I just recently joined the National Taiwan University. And um, it is my great pleasure to share with you our recent work on how to move towards the fundamental limits of efficient quantum transduction. So let me first give a, a brief overview of my research spectrum. So I'm a theorist and I've been focusing on quantum theory with bosonic systems. So in contrast to the more conventional way of encoding and compute quantum information on qubit-based devices, they have like two distinct eigenstates. Here, there are a lot of recent interests in focusing on continuous variable systems or infinite dimensional systems like uh, harmonic oscillators. Oh, where should I point? Okay. Anyway, I don't need it. So yeah, so for oscillator systems like photons, it has infinite dimensional helper space. You can think of zero, one, two, three, uh, and to infinite number of photons. For using oscillators, we can leverage this infinite helper space to encode and protect your quantum information. So we can use it on quantum computation. And also we can use bosonic system for quantum simulation. Because you have this large helper space, um, the dynamics of the sonic system will be, go beyond the complexity of the classical computer that can solve. So we can use a controllable quantum sonic system to simulate their dynamics. That's called quantum simulation. And for this talk, I've been focusing on quantum communication with sonic systems. So to echo with this, uh, the topic of this forum, they will be talking about that if we use the sonic system to encode and send information, and in principle, we'll be able to send a lot more than using a qubit, a qubit based device. Yeah. So we're, the long term motivation behind this line of work is that we would like to build, be able to build a quantum networks. And the previous speakers and also speakers in the afternoon, they all uh, present a lot about why we're interested in quantum internet, but I'll just give another short uh, motivation. So imagine that we now have this quantum internet that will be able to send our quantum signal from one place of the world to another. And we can use that to realize a lot of applications such as quantum key distribution or post-quantum encryption, et cetera. And or at the smaller scale, if we can link smaller quantum processors, we'll be able to build a modular quantum computer that is fault tolerant and for to do large scale quantum computation, et cetera. But this is actually a really challenging task. So first of all, we have to be able to send quantum information, which is fragile in the lab already. We have to send it across long distances. And also at each local knob after and before you send and receive the signal, you have to be able to have high fidelity quantum control in order to process your quantum states. And there's no single quantum platform can achieve 
these criteria simultaneously. So here's the solution that we can actually use a hybrid model that we not only rely on one quantum components, but we would like to be able to connect hybrid quantum system to leverage their different advantage and use that to build a hybrid quantum network. So for example, in the local computation, local knob, now leading platform include trap ions, um, superconducting qubits, quantum dots, etc. But those are not quite mobile. You cannot imagine that you send your trap ions over across the ocean to another country. So locally, we would like to have this different type of information in our local uh, mature quantum processors that's in development. But for communication, especially for long range quantum communication, the natural information carrier will be photons. So if you send signal of quantum photons via optical fibers, we can actually have long range, uh, long range communication that's already available. So, so the, thinking of this hybrid system, that we will use these local quantum computers, like in the, for example, micro scale, as our quantum components that will compute and then um, process our quantum states. And if we can convert that into optical signals, and then we will send the signal through the optical fibers to a, a, another knot, and then we'll convert that signal back to the whatever quantum processor we're using or not. So thinking about this, then we will have this hybrid quantum network can finally realize our dream to build a networks and to uh, realize all the application promised by quantum mechanics. So here's the key elements that we have to be able to build in before we can realize this quantum networks that is called a quantum transducers. So classically, uh, classical transducers are devices that can change the information from one form of energy to another. So here for quantum transducer, we're focusing on the coherent quantum platforms that won't be able to convert your quantum signal from one form of energy or one form of platform to another. Okay. Yeah, so this talk will focus on quantum transaction and how can we build efficient quantum transaction devices. So here I'm showing you some of the recent development and on quantum transducers. So there, like I said before, so right now the most demanding quantum transducer will be those that can be able to connect micro and optical frequency in order to build a hybrid quantum network. But there are also uh, optical micro uh, frequency conversion between optical system, micro system, they are all really helpful in connecting different quantum devices. So there's some example. So on the right here, we have this electric optical devices that will use a chi material to directly convert an optical signal to micro signal. And there are more complicated proposals as well. Like in GILA, they use the electro optical mechanics systems that they will first convert their micro signal to a mechanical membrane motion. That will be the full known mode. And then use the optical mechanical interactions to convert that to optical signal. And also my collaborator and I at Yale University, we work on using the magnon in the middle to bridge this transaction. And so transaction can be direct uh, with the one intermediate mode or more complicated if you consider atomic system that will use like two or even like four way mixing process that involve another additional modes in the meantime. So I've been focusing on these different projects. So right now there are a lot of different experimental platform competing for quantum transducer because it is really challenging. So, so far the efficiency and the, the performance is not still, uh, we don't still have a winning platform. And we would like to study that and to see how we can, go, uh, our theories would like to know how to design the best available quantum transducers for our future use. I also want to briefly mention that I'll be focusing on direct transducers that's sending a signal through our devices and then uh, receive it at the other end. So I want to talk about that. Uh, indeed, there's other transduction scheme that, for example, you can use adaptive control that will recycle a signal before you can increase your efficiency or use entanglement based device to do quantum teleportation or using uh, just use it several times for quantum interference. And so there are other technology or other resources available, but I'll be focusing on direct quantum transistor that, um, are, that can describe all these different type of experimental devices. Okay. So the natural questions arise. Do we have this different kind of platform, right? And they are also 
racing for the same goal, but how do we compare them? Uh, traditionally, we use three different figures of memory to characterize our transducer. So first of all, if you want to send a signal, and then we first care about efficiency. So since we are sending a signal without any amplification, so the highest or the max ideal efficiency will be one, which means that you will be able to convert all the fraction of your sending information to from the sender to the receiver. So this is a really key um, element that we have to build our system in order to achieve high efficiency. But in, in addition to that, this doesn't have to be in the low noise um, environment such that we'll be able to resolve your signal from the noisy background, right? And another thing that can be beneficial for transducers is that we would want that it can be able to transmit information not only within some small narrow frequency range, but over a broad bandwidth. So now the question comes, if we use different criteria, then it's actually really difficult to compare different devices. So let me show two examples uh, for a transducer on the left and on the right. So here I'm plotting the efficiency of a transducer as a function of frequency. And you can see immediately that the transducer on the left, so this doesn't have as high efficiency as the one on the right, but it has a much broader band. So if we compare these two together, they win in one uh, criteria, but lose in another one. So how can we tell which one is better? So to address this question, so my collaborators and I, we use quantum capacity. So in the previous talk, Marco talked about classical capacity, and we like to use quantum capacity, which is um, tells us the capacity of a quantum communication capability of, of devices. So for using that, we'll be able to, I will show you that we'll be able to, to say that the transducer on the right can transmit more quantum information per unit time. So therefore, it's a better transducer than the other. Also to iterate, uh, the idea here is to use quantum capacity to characterize and compare different quantum transducers. So the uh, physical meaning of quantum capacity is that it's called the, the highest achievable qubit quantum computation ray through a channel. So, so right now we want to send information from Alice to Bob through a quantum channel. And then when we first send it, Alice can try to encode it in different quantum error correction code, et cetera, and try to encode as much information as possible. And then it will pass through our noisy quantum channel. And then as the receiver and Bob will receive the signal and then try to decode it. So the quantum capacity will be the optimal or the highest communication rate that is optimized over all the possible encoding and decoding protocols. So what uh, previously I talked about, like Marco said, about like Holovo, he also um, calculated quantum capacity. But what people previously discussed are called the discrete time quantum capacity. So this is assuming that you have a single channel, have a, some fixed efficiency, and then you send over this channel and the discrete time quantum capacity will quantify the maximum amount of quantum information that can be transmitted per use of this channel. Okay. So let's take two example. If you have an ideal qubit channel, it means that if you send in a qubit signal and then the receiver will receive a perfect, the same state of the qubit. Then in this time, then the qubit channel, the capacity will be one. But for an ideal basonic channel, the advantage is that for a photon, because it has like infinite dimensional Hilbert space, so in principle, we can encode infinite amount of information just sending one bosonic mode. So for an ideal bosonic channel, this quantum capacity can be infinity. But in reality, uh, we don't have this infinite power to send in the signal because that would involve infinite amount of photons. So uh, this has to be more realistically have to consider the cost of energy, but in principle, sending information through bosonic system will be more, much more efficient than using the qubit channel. Okay. So again, so we have this channel, and then how we would like to use that to model the different quantum platforms that we just talked about. So for this quantum channel, so I think the benefits of being a theorist is that we can look at all these different you know, devices and we we'll try to find a simple way to uh, to model them together and then discuss them, generalize them. So what we model is that we can discuss like all these different experimental proposal into this simple bosonic chain model, such that we'll send some input signal A in and A out to a bosonic mode A. It can be our micro mode, for example. And then it was through uh, coupling with near nearest neighbor bosonic mode. And then at the end, 
after some time, we'll be able to receive the signal at the B mode's end. It can be our optical signal. And then we can, so this is our model of quantum transducers. And we found that in order to use the language of capacity, and this model is actually the action is equivalent to a thermal loss channel. So what a thermal loss channel do is that you can think of if you have some beam splitter-like system. So if you have a, the output mode will be a fraction of your input signal it depends on the efficiency and also some um, noises from the environment about like one minus eta. Okay, so this is action of quantum channel and like to use this thermal channel's capacity to parallax our transducer. So if you study the thermal loss channels such that the environment may have some non-zero mean photon number, it's actually pretty difficult to calculate and uh, we don't have analytical form. But luckily, since thermal loss is not an uh, intrinsic property of the channel because we can cool down the environment, etc., So we can study this special channel, it's called a pure loss channel. When the M bar is zero, that corresponds to a vacuum environment or when you, uh, when, the, when your system can ignore the thermal background, if you cool it down cold enough, then we can use this, this, this pure loss channel. And Holovod and others, they have studied the discrete time pure loss channel. That's if you have some efficiency of the channel eta, and then they have described what the maximum amount of qubits can ch transmitted per use of such channel. So this small Q one here is called the one-way channel capacity, the one-way quantum capacity, assuming to have a one-way quantum communication. Uh, some <coughs> key features that if you have less than one half of efficiency, it means that more than half of information are lost to the environment, then you cannot send any quantum information. You can uh, think of this using the idea of no cloning theorem. So since you have lost uh, more than half of information to your environment, so if you can recover faithful quantum information, it means that you can make a copy and the environment can also make a copy. So that will violate no cooling theorem. So that's why you have to surpass this one half threshold if you only have one way quantum communication. And but when you have the ideal channel that efficiency is one, then you have infinite quantum capacity. And below here, the small Q2, uh, it's the two way quantum capacity that is further assisted by two way classical uh, communication. And then you can see that as long as you have non-zero efficiency, you can have some capacity. And again, you will have infinite capacity if you have an ideal channel. So this is uh, what people purely discuss, but we would like to think of more realistic scenario of transducers. Since we all not only care about efficiency, we also care about the bandwidth, right? If we can send different signal, and then we can actually use this different frequency of the signal as independent channel. And then we can use that to send more information at a time. So if we treat different frequency uh, seed mode as independent channels, we can add their capacity together. So this is what we, uh, we introduce is a continuous time pure loss capacity of the channel. So we add, we sum up the capacity of different frequency, and then for different frequency in the realistic divide, they will have different efficiency. And then we'll take the continuous limits, so we integrate them together. So now this pure loss capacity is of the unit of qubits per second. So you can use that to find the rate of the qubit communication that can be sent through the capacity, uh, quantum transducer. And we use this as a benchmark to find what's the optimal design of transducers. So with that, when they're asking the question, so how do we map, use this language and to map into our physical systems? So with, with that, we have uh, developed this toolbox. We have this formalism for this end-stage quantum transducers. So we don't need to, uh, uh, we don't too worried about details. We just want to show you that we have this toolbox available. Now be able to write down the efficiency of our transducer as a function of signal frequency. So, and this will be um, determined by the physical parameters of our experiment systems, that including the copas, they are the coupling rate with the environment and also with the signal input and output port. And also G are the coupling between the nearby systems. And also a delta started detuning or like a frequency in the framework that you would like to read about these different modes. So the key concept is that we will be, we are now able to write down the efficiency as a function of those kappa, deltas, and g's. And then we would like to optimize these and just see, hey, with this, um, this design and how can we achieve the highest possible 
quantum capacity. So this is uh, what we found. So we put in a physical constraint such that we assume that we have some maximum available coupling strings. And this is the reason is that in experiment, usually the most demanding resource is the co coherent coupling. So we use this Gmax as our physical constraint. And then under this physical constraint, we look for the optimal parameters for different kind of transducer. So we studied, uh, so for the transducer, we call this like n-state transducer that involve n intermediate mode. So for a different number of this capital N, and we look for the optimal design. And we found that for each n, the best transducer are those with the maximally flat efficiency function. So on the left, this is the example of the zero stage efficiency. And then on the right, you can generalize that to the n stage maximally flat efficiency. If we visualize that in the picture, you can see we plot this efficiency function as a function of frequency uh, with different number of n. You can see that we have a flat plateau in the middle and near the peak of transmission. But when we, under this constraint of a physical coupling strain that is Gmax, and then they would, we have a flatter plateau in the middle, but we increase the number of capital N as if we prolong the line of our Bassani chain, we actually have like a smaller bandwidth for this transducer. Okay. So this is uh, what we found about the, we have this analytical formula for the parameters of this maximally flat transducer. So we found that in order to achieve this maximally flat efficiency, first of all, they have to be lossless so that we don't have any information lost to the environment. And also we found that they have to be all resonant and their parameter has a symmetric structure and it's also related to what we call the matching condition. That is the condition to tell what the parameters have to satisfy in order to achieve unity or ideal conversion efficiency. So we found that it's actually associated with the N plus two fold degenerate solution for the matching condition. So I'm also writing down the, um, these are the parameters that we found given by our constraint Gmax. And to give you a little bit of idea, so I'm showing this N equals 10 as an example, you can see that they will all have this structure that will have this symmetric coupling uh, across, uh, across this chain. And then the coupling strain is always strongest on the two end, and then it will decrease when you move toward the middle of this Bassani chain. Okay. So for people from uh, electronic engineering background, you might immediately observe that, hey, actually, the response of a maximum flat transducer is a direct analog to a butterworth filter in the electronic network. So you can see they have like the same efficiency function that we have with our end stage is corresponding to the n plus two order butterworth filter network, and we we can actually find a one to one correspondence between our basonic chain physical parameters to the RLC values of a butterworth filter network. So now we're equipped the tool to study the quantum capacity of these transducers. And so here's what we found. Uh, first, we have this, we already found this maximum flat efficiency, right? And we convert that efficiency as a dependent on frequency into the capacity as a function of frequency. And then we integrate over frequency. And we arrive at this capital Q. They are what we call the continuous time quantum capacity. That's quantifies the maximum amount of qubit can be transmitted per unit time. So on the top, we plot the one way and below it's a two way that is assisted by the two way classical communication. And what we found is that, hey, when we increase the number of stages or we increase the length of our Bassani chain, we would saturate actually some value. And for either one, both one way and two way, communication, they saturate to the same value. And this, same, this value is given by this formula this Qmax, and this is proportional to Gmax. So now we have this property, uh, found this a fundamental limits that to connect the coupling rate of our physical system to the quantum communication rate of the transducer. And we found this will be the physical limit that is like the highest possible rate that one can achieve using the design of quantum transducers. So finally, I'd like to show that, um, so Previously, I was talking about pure loss capacity, but we can actually also include the effect of thermal loss as well. But for thermal loss, like I mentioned briefly before, we don't have a good analytical formula for that. But luckily, we can use some analytical 
upper and lower bounds to approach their values. So here I'm plotting the capacities of one-way and two-way thermal loss channel that includes a non-zero M bar, that is a non-zero photon number background. So on the left, I plot M bar equals to one. On the right, I plot M bar equals to 10. The green triangles are the upper bound values. That's non for now. And then the red one, the red triangles are the lower bound value. And then we compare those values to the blue circles. The blue circles are the answer from the pure loss channel that before we consider thermal loss. So you can see that indeed when you have a large number of thermal background, you will decrease your quantum capacity. But when we increase the number of stages for this maximally flat transducer, and actually this difference will shrink, and then it will go to zero when you uh, go to the limit that you have an infinitely long chain. So that shows that our design of this maximally flat transducer is not only give rise to the highest capacity, but is also robust against thermal loss. So with that, uh, here are some take home message. So we've studied that, uh, I hope I've convinced you that transducers are the key elements that can help us build hybrid quantum networks. And also uh, in this work that we would um, combine the concepts of efficiency, bandwidth and noise and using a single quantitative element that is the continuous time quantum capacity to characterize and com compare transducers. And also we, from that, we found the physical coupling rate can actually limit the maximally uh, quantum communication rate. And for more details, I can refer to our recent publications. And I'd like to thank my uh, collaborators, fund agencies, and thank you all for attention. OK, uh, do we have any questions? Uh, hello, uh, I have a... Uh, a question, because I just read some Professor Holeva's paper, mm -hmm. and there's a, there's a conjecture called uh, Gaussian optimizer conjecture. It's, uh, it's about the Gaussian Poisson Gaussian channel. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in, your, in, the, in the domain, you, in this research line, you just intro, introduce, uh, do people believe that the conjecture is true or not, or whether the conjecture is true, will, the, it, will it affect the results about your <laughs> research field. Uh, yeah, thanks. thank you for the question. I think that the question is about uh, Holovo's uh, uh, conjecture on quantum. Gaussian optimizer conjecture. Yeah, so I'd like to admit that, so I'm not like really for the information theory background. So I'm, if you can elaborate more on what the conjecture is. Oh, so. Yeah, it's about, um, they, uh, the conjecture is about, uh, they assume that the optimal uh, optimal communication protocol will will assume uh, will attain at the Gaussian state input, but not the other. Okay, so, so the okay, so with that, I so the, your question is about uh, like whether this conjecture uh, is oh, true or not, this yeah, or the, will wait, wait, like how, whether this will yes. affect our protocol, right? Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Thank you for the question. Thank, thank I would say yes. We indeed use like Gaussian quantum channel because the thermal loss channel that we just introduced is one type of Gaussian channel. And, but in principle, because we want to really encode information and encode information in a Gaussian state is not like the best way to, to leverage all this extra degrees of freedom. So what, uh, so, uh, really key, another key um, direction in this field is that we're actually looking for quantum error correction code. Like for different quantum error correction code, we want to fit that into actual channel. So not really just look at the capacity that is like the highest fundamental limits, but we would like to look at uh, some explicit codes and try to find a code that can properly approach this capacity value. Yes, yeah, so I think that that's the re research field and I hope that addressed your question. Thank you. Oh, th thank you for your answer. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, thank you for a good presentation. Uh, I about the uh, quantum uh, transducers, do we, do it need to preserve the phase of the information of the photons, and uh, what the uh, current status of this if uh, the phase need to be to be preserved? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, thank you for the question. I think the question was about uh, how to preserve the the phase of our signal. Yeah. So I think for transducers, because we are now using this Bassani model, so we're we are looking at like the operator point of view, but we can actually convert that into like the state point of view. So uh, I, th I think the answer is that um, 
if we have a perfect transducer, so in, in principle, we will preserve your initial state to the final state uh, from the input to the output. So yeah, in order to preserve quantum information, and we, we need to yeah, also preserve the quantum coherence and also the phase. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, how about the, uh, the uh, experiment results? Yeah, so for experimental results, yeah. yes, so <laughs> I think that's a, yes, it's a key question is about experimental results. So like I say, there are different type of quantum transducers, and um, for, oh sorry, like for microwave to microwave or optical to optical frequency converter, I think they can actually do very high efficiency, so can, they can actually convert like really nice and phaseable quantum states for those like microwave to microwave or optical to optical frequencies. Yeah, but for micro to optical frequency, that's kind of the tricky part. So right now we don't really have a devices that can surpass this one half threshold for that you can transmit like non-zero quantum information. So I would say the hardware is still on, it's still in progress. So because the capacity is still like, la is still zero at the current stage. So we would not be able to preserve quantum coherence at, in the meantime for microwave to optical transducer, but they are working on it, enhancing it. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Okay. Uh, so there is a question from online audience. So, so the question is, what are the challenges in using microwave frequency for transmitting quantum state instead of optical frequency? Okay, yeah, thank uh, you. Okay. So the question is about uh, what's the challenging of using microwave? Mm -hmm. So I would say the, the challenge is that, so first of all, because of the frequency, right? So micro is at a much lower frequency than optical frequency. So it is much successful to the thermal noise background. And also, um, if you're thinking about, you want to transmit this microwave fre frequency like from super quantum qubit, then you have to build a really like cold line in order to move your qubit of information or a basonic of information around. So that would be the, the challenge. But luckily we can utilize this available technique of optical fibers. So that's why I think right now the um, like the leading or like most promising way is to combine different systems in order to, to build a hybrid quantum network. Yeah, thank you for the question from the online audience. Uh, we can take one more, that's from there. Yeah, I just have a question on the second to uh, last slide. Uh, should I interpret that uh, plot as uh, uh, how this scale, how this uh, transducer scales with uh, thermal loss or uh, thermal noise? Because uh, I uh, maybe it doesn't it just doesn't make intuitive sense to me if you added more uh, oscillator or bosonic mode to the system. It seems like the noise should increase as you increase the number of modes. And here it seems like it's approaches a certain value and does not increase from there. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. I think the, the question is about that it may be counterintuitivity to, uh, that when we increase the line of our system and but we still approach this value rather than like harmonious because of this extra mode in the middle. So, uh, so the answer to that is, is actually, is, the reason is that we are looking at the optimal parameters. So in looking for the fundamental limits and in this case, we will assume that we found that the best capacity is achieved when we don't have loss in the middle. But, but like you said, in practice, we have to consider trade-off that if you add more intermediate modes, they would uh, necessarily introduce more losses in the middle. And what would, that will convey into this picture is that it will lower the efficiency. So what it comes into is that it will lower the efficiency so that we will have more thermal loss coming in. So in, in the real world device, and you can ha actually have to find this trade off and uh, uh, maybe like using the real physical parameters from a uh, measure from the experiment, we can look for some design that should have some finite lens. Thank you. Okay. Um. I think uh, time is up for this section, so maybe that's, uh, if you have further questions, uh, just uh, execute offline and we could pass it to the speakers. Okay, so this uh, concludes the, the morning section. Let's uh, uh, thank all the speakers in the morning again. Thank you. Thank you.